Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, where we explore the accuracy and authority of the Bible. I'm your host, Henry Smith. Today, we're joined by our guest, Dr. Dwayne Bryant, who's here today to talk about the historicity of King David. Dr. Bryant is a Bible professor at Faulkner University in Alabama and has long been engaged in Christian apologetics. Well, Dwayne, welcome back to Digging for Truth. It's good to have you on again. It's great to be back. All right. Last time we were together, we talked about the question, is Christianity a mystery cult? Uh, that, that was a great episode uh, and hope uh, folks can hear about your background if they go back and, and watch that show. But today, we're, we're, it's quite a different subject we want to talk about, something that's, I think, dear to both of our hearts and should be for, for a lot of people, and that is uh, King David and the historicity of not only him as a person, but the scope of his kingdom. Um, a very important subject. You've done a lot of work on this. You have a great interest in it. So uh, we're going to explore that together today. Uh, so in your dissertation, actually, you did quite a bit of work on this, and you explored some of the questions about, uh, first, we're going to jump right in. So the portrait of David as given in the Bible, uh, and is it realistic? I guess that's the big question we'll start off with, and then we'll kind of develop it throughout the show. Okay, so the portrait of David, is it something that's historically plausible? That was, that was my question. Uh, that was not the original topic for my dissertation. Uh, it was actually suggested to me. Um, I wanted to do something else, but I got into this because of my love for the Old Testament and evidence for the accuracy of the Old Testament. And the more I got into the story of David, the more I realized that this was sort of a, uh, a very important piece of Old Testament history. And when looking at David, so many people see him as this kind of mythological or legendary figure. And so what I wanted to do was explore the idea of, is the biblical portrait of David plausible? Is it historically plausible? Because you have so many elements of it that are just sort of dismissed. And when I started digging into it and exploring it further, um, what I quickly found out was that if you have a, a sensible um, understanding of the biblical text, you compare it to other documentation from the ancient world, the life of David is not implausible in any way. It's, it's, it's absolutely believable historically. And so, so when you say that, uh, you would be referring to other kings— who described their reigns in a similar fashion. We're not talking about his unique relationship with Yahweh, but we are talking about his dealing with other countries, his military prowess, those kind of things. Talk, talk about that a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, give us some, a couple highlights, if you would, in that comparison. Okay. So with the, um, well, and this is actually where the Bible sort of stands out, because when you look at biography of ancient Near Eastern kings, um, and accounts of their military campaigns and things like that, a lot of it's actually filled with magic and, and sometimes propaganda, and you rarely ever see the king looking bad. And, and so with David, it's like, you know, one of the biggest stories is his sin with Bathsheba, and that immediately stands out. Um, the fact that he's rebuked by Nathan, that immediately sets the Bible apart from so many of these other accounts. Yes. But as far as his depiction as a king, as a warrior, as an administrator, even throwing in some of the less flattering moments of his life, yes. his, his whole dispute with Nabal and, and Abigail having to keep him from butchering a bunch of innocent guys or his adultery with Bathsheba, which was a capital offense in the ancient world. Um, it actually comes out looking very plausible. I mean, there, there, there's no, there are no red flags that immediately jump out and say, you know, hey, there, there's something about this that doesn't quite have the ring of truth. I mean, all of it, all of it sounds uh, like it, it is absolutely within the realm of historical plausibility. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because because a lot of people say, you know, this has this is supernatural stuff that's being described, his relationship with Yahweh, what Yahweh is doing through David and in that time period and all that. And then what you highlight is other ancient texts are, are dripping with their own theology. It's just a different theology. And somehow scholars think that that's historical in the Bible, somehow not. Uh, you know, there's a sort of contradiction in the, in the methodology. Now, backtracking a little bit, um, one of the things that you wanted to talk about uh, is 
uh, where, where David's career sort of gets off to a start, and that is his encounter with Goliath. Um, mm -hmm. let, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, is this some kind of boy's adventure tale, or uh, what's your insights on that? Okay, so the way this is usually described is this is a you know typical adventure story, fairy tale hero um, uh, kind of situation. Uh, various scholars uh, like Baruch Halpern, I believe, uh, described David as a delicate little amateur uh, in this. Uh, other other scholars uh, who who have a more critical eye toward the Bible uh, ex describe David similarly. And the way they they seem to look at it is it's sort of like people like Harry Potter or Percy Jackson. For for viewers who are familiar with those, Harry Potter, I'm sure everybody knows. He starts out as 12 years old, right? Percy Jackson, who is, you know, in, in a couple of movies, and now there's a Disney Plus series, I think, that's going to be uh, going through Rick Riordan's um, series about this guy who's supposedly the, uh, I believe he's the son of Poseidon. And, you know, he starts out as 12. Well, they, they do things that no 12, that no 20-year-old would do. I mean, th these are things that are beyond the capabilities of a 12 year old. Yes, yes. And people see David similarly. Oh, here's this little kid basically out of swaddling diapers, goes out and beats Goliath, this huge giant, right? And I, I think if we actually look at the text and appreciate the text and the text description of David, what we're going to see is this is anything but some little kid going out to defeat a seasoned warrior. This is actually something that has the ring of truth about it. And I actually uh, uh, wrote an article about this that uh, was in Bible and Spade in the fall 2019 issue. And it's on the ABR website for, for those who may want to, to go read that. I actually explore this quite a bit. All the things that uh, show the, the disconnect between the traditional view of David as this little kid who goes out to beat Goliath versus what really seems to be going on, completely being described from the text itself, it seems to say that, no, this he's already a soldier. He, he's already a, a fighter of some kind at this stage. He's very improvisational. Um, even you know uh, Baruch Halpern, who's a scholar who's written a biography of David, he says, yeah, you know, I have to admit, David's a guy who fights outside the ring. Uh, he's somebody who is innovative. And there's nothing implausible about that. It actually, it actually makes sense once you read the text very, yeah. very closely. Yeah, it's interesting. We maybe we get impressions in our mind, even from artwork, the way that Goliath is depicted in David. David, you know, sort of fair skin, sort of effeminate, a little effeminate looking. Goliath is giant monster. Like we don't know that that's actually the way he looked. You know what I mean? Like so, it's interesting how even things like art can affect the way that you view. Uh, I, I think the lesson that you're you're pointing to here, Dwayne, and we got to go to a break, is is uh, the text, the text, the text. Carefully study the text because it tells us something different. Well, friends, we'll be right back with uh, Dr. Bryant. We're going to explore further the question about King David. We'll be right back. ABR is excited to announce the publication of Volume Two from our excavations at Kerbet El Makater. The volume details archaeological remains from about 350 BC to the 8th century. This includes a New Testament village that may have been visited by Jesus. Over 400 pages of analysis, photos, and maps. You can pick up a copy today by visiting BibleArchaeology.org. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website, lighthousetv.org, for more information. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm here with Dr. Dwayne Bryant. We're talking about King David. Now, in our last segment, we were talking about his encounter with Goliath. I want to point our viewers to an episode I did with Dr. Boyd Seavers on sling stones in the ancient Near East and the plausibility of David being able to kill Goliath with that uh, very detailed episode that we walked through all that evidence. Uh, but, but kind of drawing back, Dwayne, uh, to the broader picture of archaeological evidence for David, um, let's talk about that because there's some great stuff out there that some folks may be tuning in for the first time I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the big questions is, are there any inscriptions that mention David? And there are a couple that do have his name. 
There are some questions surrounding those, how to interpret that. But generally speaking, we're going to look at a couple of mon- a couple of monuments, a couple of stelas. One is the Teldan inscription. One is the Mesha stela, or the Mesha inscription. And both of those make a reference to the house of David, the Beit David. And for uh, biblical minimalists, which would be scholars who are extraordinarily skeptical, who believe that you know, if, if, if it's in the Bible, the only way that you can accept it as truth is if it is absolutely corroborated by historical and archaeological evidence. They, they dismiss this. Most scholars, from what I can tell, do not. They, they see this as a legitimate reference to the name of David. And this is how um, uh, great powers in the ancient world would often refer to smaller kingdoms. They would say, you know, this kingdom is the house of so-and-so. We have numerous examples of this. Uh, In Assyrian records, we've got examples of um, uh, Assyrian rulers calling the northern kingdom the house of Omri. They call it that for almost 200 years, right? So you have this, this fact of the house of David, and when they use this phrase, it was typically the name of the founder of the reigning dynasty, So the house of David is referring to the Southern kingdom. It seems to be referring to uh, the, 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 the the kingdom of Judah in a way that recognizes the historicity of this founding King David, whose dynasty is still in place. So the Tel Dan inscription mentions this. This is a uh, inscription probably from Hazael of Aram Damascus, ninth century, the Mesha Stila, which is an inscription of, from a Moabite king. Uh, it was discovered in the 1800s. Sometimes it's called a forgery. The technology didn't exist back then to make forgeries yeah. like this. And so it's absolutely, absolutely uh, uh, legitimate. Yeah, yeah, I think the, the one of the key points that you're hitting on here is the recognition of Israel's enemies in both of these inscriptions at a, t- at a time after David is dead, recognizing his importance, uh, calling it the house of David. So the, there's a different king on the throne in Israel in both of these situations, Israel and mm-hmm. Judah, right? So, uh, you know, I, I see that as uh, of extreme importance, which you, which you highlighted. So it's not David ruling, although that would be fantastic if the scripture was from his time, but an acknowledgement of even people centuries later knew who David was. That's ex- that's extraordinary to me. Mm-hmm. Now, now um, I want to shift. I, I'd love to talk about that more, but we got so much we want to cover. Uh, let's let's shift to the question of Jerusalem because, <laughs> as I joke with you, you know, skeptics sometimes will acknowledge a David, but he was just a tribal chieftain in charge of. We love to say here at ABR, uh, Gary Byers particularly says a podunk cow town called Jerusalem. Right. Okay. So Mm -hmm. now the question is, uh, what does the archaeology tell us about Jerusalem? Is it a podunk cow town or is there something else going on? All right. So what seems to be the case here, and and you've got guys who have almost made careers off of this. Israel Finkelstein is is one guy who uh, I think he called it a one horse town. It was something similar, you know, and and, and tries to downdate everything. Right. But uh, his views have not really won a lot of acceptance. What does seem to be the case is Jerusalem is a town on the smaller side, but there is a considerable amount of evidence that suggests it was actually very wealthy and was even big enough to be the target of an Egyptian invasion. All right, so uh, as far as the... Uh, just the archaeological data, it is fairly difficult to really get at what Jerusalem was, uh, what size it was in antiquity, maybe around the time of of David, because there's so much modern development on top of it. There's You've got the Temple Mount, you've got modern buildings, uh, you've got the fact that Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt so many times. There uh, was Roman quarrying that went on, Byzantine construction that happened. So You've got a lot of of development and just sort of a a shifting of of, of the scenery there 
that makes things difficult. That's not that unusual, uh, I guess, in this part of the world, but uh, but it does complicate this in, in particular. What we do know is that during the, the rule of Pharaoh Akhenaten, um, he had a series of letters that he wrote to uh, various places in, um, in the Levant uh, called the Amarna Letters. And so in the 14th century, there is a reference, we think, to Jerusalem. Yes. And it is a you know, city large enough to be the recipient of communications from the Pharaoh of Egypt. Um, it has a king who rules over it. We know his name, Abdi Heba. Uh, we uh, have information that this was part of an inherited dynasty or inherited kingship. And so it seems to be a significant town 300 years at least before David even arrives on the scene. Um, and then you've got other information about uh, Solomon's wealth, which I think we're going to get to in just a little bit. But uh, things dealing with that. And so you, you, you've got, um, during the time of Solomon, an invasion by King uh, Shoshink or Pharaoh Shoshink uh, of Egypt. And the invasion of the Levant is recorded in something called the Bubastite portal at Karnak Temple. Lots of names uh, uh, of, of towns and cities that he's captured. Jerusalem does not appear on that list. We know some of the names are missing. But based on the travels of that campaign, it appears that he made a break for the hill country where Jerusalem was situated. And the only reason they would have done that is if he was going toward a particularly juicy target, sure. a small capital city, a wealthy city like Jerusalem would have been in his sights. And so that completely makes sense. And looking at that list of his his targets in his campaign, that Jerusalem would have been one of his one of his targets. Well, that was a tour de force, Dwayne. What we're going to do in our next segment is kind of uh, go into some of the details of those highlights that you just went over. And we're going to go to a break right now. We'll be right back after this message. In a culture of intense Bible denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website, lighthousetv.org, for more information. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. We're talking about King David with Dr. Dwayne Bryant. Okay, Bryant, uh, uh, Dwayne, sorry. Let's, we're going to backtrack slightly to our previous segment to hit some of these highlights that you talked about. Let's talk about the invasion of Shishak. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the inscriptions in Egypt that refer to this. Uh, give us a little bit more about, about that uh, and its importance in, into the question of the significance of Jerusalem. Okay, so this does give us a, uh, a kind of an idea of the importance of Jerusalem, even though some of the information is lacking. Okay, so 1 Kings 14, 2 Chronicles 12 is where the Bible records this particular uh, invasion. And he goes in, he, he describes having you know, taken lots of different cities and towns um, uh, on, on this area of Karnak Temple, which was a temple complex in Egypt. Um, it's called the Bubastite Portal. Okay? And so he is going through, taking these towns, taking um, a plunder. And what happens is Shoshank, uh, the first or Shikshak, biblically, uh, goes back home Unfortunately, he dies not long after the invasion, maybe a year or two after the invasion. He, um, uh, he, he dies, and his son, Osorkon I, then takes the throne. Well, one of the things Egyptian pharaohs would do when they would come back from military campaigns is they would make a donation of some of the plunder to the Egyptian temples. And what is absolutely fascinating about this is that when Shoshenk dies— his son, Osorkon I, makes that donation uh, instead, and uh, the records tell us that he donated 383 tons 
of gold and silver, which just so happened to be the largest amount ever given to the temples of ancient Egypt. So when we're talking about, you know, was Jerusalem a big wealthy city? Was, you know, Judea? Uh, was, did, did, did it have much by way of development? Uh, it seems absolutely yes, because they, because they, they were able to gather a record-breaking amount of loot when they went on this campaign yes. and came back and donated it to the Egyptian temples. Yeah, it's hard not to make the inferences. And if you take the biblical text seriously, it fits very nicely, very, very seamlessly. Uh, that, that's, that's extraordinary stuff. Okay, so now you, you, you mentioned the, the problem with Jerusalem in terms of archaeology because there's a modern city there. But not far from Jerusalem, we have an administrative center that's been, that's been uncovered called Kermit Kaiafa. It's large. Mm -hmm. Uh, it required a, a, a strong state to build. It's from the time of David. Tell us a little bit about that because that fits this picture. Okay, so what really helps with understanding the historicity of the biblical uh, kingdom, the, the, the Davidic monarchy, is just how widespread uh, the bureaucracy must have been to construct a place like Kirbet Kiafa, which is about 25 miles away, which is a pretty good distance in the ancient world, even though for us it's just you know 30 minutes in the car. But it was constructed, its defenses were constructed out of almost a quarter of a million tons of stone. You had to have, I mean, a, a little chieftain on top of a little hill did not have the ability to construct something like this. There had to have, to have been some kind of uh, bureaucratic machinery in place to yes. organize a construction project like this, which dates to the United Monarchy. You also have writing that is there. So the, the Kirbet Kiafa Ostrakhan, which is very similar to the Bible in some respects. You know, plead for the widow, plead for the orphan, you know, all that kind of stuff, stuff that you read in the Mosaic Law. Um, somebody is there at a time when most people are illiterate. Somebody is there who can send and receive communications from a place like Jerusalem. So the uh, and, and then you've got uh, examples like the Tel Zayat inscription and others where you have examples of writing in fairly remote places, that tells us that somebody's training scribes, somebody's sending them to remote places. Naturally, what you're going to think of is they need people like this to administrate a kingdom. Yeah, that, that's good stuff. Again, it's a, it's a matrix of evidence collected together, not just Jerusalem proper, but the whole large picture of the archaeology fits Kingdom of David's description in the Bible so well. Okay, our last topic, we got a little bit over a minute to cover this one, so you're gonna have to do a quick tutorial on Solomon's wealth, because this sort of like is backtracked to David. Yeah, this is not legitimate, therefore David's not legitimate. There's sort of an interconnection between the two. Talk a little bit about uh, Solomon's wealth as we wrap up. Okay, so one of the misconceptions a lot of people have is, well, Solomon was the wealthiest king in the entire world because the, the Bible does describe his wealth as being e enormous uh, in a couple of different places at First Kings and Second Chronicles. What we do know, uh, oh, and let me back up, that is sometimes used as a point of criticism against the biblical account um, because how could Solomon have been so wealthy? Well, we do know that comparatively speaking, Solomon's wealth was significant, but not on the par of Assyrian rulers. And we have descriptions of parties they would throw and the amount of wealth that they would get year in and year out. Um, so Solomon was wealthy. His wealth was not as great as that of, of maybe Assyrian rulers that we have records of. Um, and so, it, again, it, it brings it into the realm of plausibility. Yes. Um, he was wealthy, yes. I mean, Israel was situated at a, at a crossroads with lots of trade routes. You would expect that. That's why when Osorkon invades, he is able to take off so much loot. But we do need to keep it in perspective. Yeah, that's good stuff, Dwayne. Well, listen, brother, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to wrap up the show here. But I really want to express my appreciation for the work you've done on this. Uh, we do want to encourage people to read your Bible and Spade article, which is on our website. And uh, I just want to express my personal appreciation for you coming on the show and, and giving us a tutorial on this. I learned some new stuff, always something new to learn. Appreciate your work, Dwayne, and I'm glad we, we got together to do this. 
Man, my pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. Uh, if you read the New Testament, you see the obvious importance of King David. His name is all over the place. In fact, the whole Bible over a thousand times. And in, in fact, people cry out for mercy to Jesus. They call him the son of David. He's a descendant of David. So his importance is, is enormously important, uh, both historically and theologically. And so we hope that today uh, that you will come to know, if you don't, uh, Jesus, the son of David, and we thank you for joining us on Digging for Truth.